reading is much more active generally than watching a movie. Like, you know, the images sort of wash over you. Um, but Chainsaw does something where <laughs> it sort of activates, activates your brain almost like a reader. Like it makes you see things that, or imagine things that aren't actually on the screen. Want to listen to this episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And for an exclusive offer, I am offering you all a free trial to our ITBR professor level, which gives you all of our episodes, all of them unedited, and you can see all of the video footage. And do you know about the ITBR book club? On November 24th, we are actually meeting for the first time in person in Manhattan, we are going to meet at 3.30 p.m. at the Morgan Library and Museum, and we are going to talk about the personal librarian. If you are also a Wicked fan, at 12.30 p.m. on the same day, the 24th, a group of us are going to see Wicked at the AMC on 42nd Street in Times Square. So if you want to like come and join us, that's where we'll be. Okay, I hope I see some of you at the in-person book club at the Morgan Library at 3.30 p.m. Sunday, November 24th. And now, enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is a very special Halloween episode, so I think that it's time to talk about all things horror. I mean... Horror is an any season topic, but that's my opinion, but especially for Halloween. So I'm joined with award-winning author Paul Tremblay, who won the Bram Stoker British Fantasy Massachusetts Book Awards. He's the nationally best-selling author of The Beast You Are, The Paul Bearers Club, Survivor Song, uh, Growing Things and Other Stories, The Cabin at the End of the World that, you know, we'll talk a lot about because M. Night Shyamalan adapted it into a knock at the cabin. Um, just a knock at the cabin, right? Not a knock at the cabin door. Yeah, no, that would be more grammatically correct. Okay. I always <laughs> want to say a knock at the cabin door. Okay. Well, that is Paul's voice, yeah. everyone. Uh, disappearance <laughs> hey, at Devil's Rock, A Head Full of Ghosts, and the crime novels The Little Sleep and Sleep Till Wonderland. He lives outside of Boston, which is so appropriate for spooky season uh, with the fall <laughs> foliage. And I'm here, well, not only to talk about A Cabin at the End of the World, but um, horror movie, which my book club is reading. It oh, has great. been, yes, so widely acclaimed. And I mean, my first question for you, Paul, is like, how did you get bit by the horror bug? Like, when did <laughs> this journey start for you? Uh, well, first, you know, thanks for having me on, Andrew. Uh, I'm excited to chat. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's funny. In some ways, it's hard to answer because, like, as long as I remember, like, I've always been sort of scared by and enjoyed horror movies. But uh, I guess we'll blame <laughs> uh, when I was like seven, eight, nine, pre cable television. Wow, I'm really aging myself. Um, there was a program that played locally in the Boston area on Saturdays called Creature Double Feature. Uh, and so the first the first movie was always like a Godzilla or Gamera a kaiju movie. Uh, and the second movie was uh, a more direct horror movie. Um, you know, usually black and white, usually something that was really goofy, but they still gave me nightmares. Like I still remember having a nightmare after watching uh, Attack of the Killer Shrews, which is such a bad movie uh, that was once shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000 at one point. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, just as long as. You know, then after that, once cable TV hits, you know, I just watched a lot of TV. Um, mm. You know, it's just always like afraid of the dark and slept with stuffed animals around my head and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Were you like specifically interested in, say, psychological horror, um, slasher films, gore horror? Like, was there yeah. one genre that you've always just been more drawn to? Um, I guess I was always more drawn to you know supernatural psychological uh kind of movies and i definitely was never a slasher fan my younger brother he was five years younger than me but uh you know once he hit like the age eight you know he was watching way more gorier stuff than i could handle um so it was just kind of funny like you know the younger brother was you know ike first saw texas chainsaw at like 10 i think i first watched it when i was in my mid to late 30s <laughs> um 
Yeah. But I mean, that's not to say like, obviously like every sort of like you say, Oh, this is what I like. There's always um, ones from other subgenres that are like, Oh no, I really like that too. Um, mm. But yeah, I tend to gravitate towards the stuff that's going to make me question if there's something under my bed or in the closet or in the basement. Yeah. So like terrifier three is not for you. No, I haven't seen any of them. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, came off of seeing um, Smile 2. Did you okay. have a chance to see Smile 2? No, it's just been so busy this fall. Like, it's so hard to get out to the uh, to the theaters. Yeah, well, because when you're not writing your, like, internationally acclaimed horror <laughs> novels and stories, you're a mathematics instructor, aren't you? True horror, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So the the, the winter, uh, the winter, the fall tends to be my busiest time of year because they actually it's a small school and they expect us to pitch in with coaching too, and that's really like the bigger time suck. Mm. I mean, if like I can handle like the school load, but then like coaching after school just takes like another hour or two, and then there's traffic and. Oh, um, but yeah, I can't complain. The school's been very supportive. Uh, so yeah, so it's like in the fall, it's usually me just trying to squeeze in what what horror I can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what do you coach? I'm just curious. Oh, uh, I'm like the third assistant on the freshman football team, you know, just a oh. body, a warm body. <laughs> I never played. In okay. High school. Well. Uh, I, I had been the long time JV high school basketball coach. Again, I didn't play any of that. I mean, I played like with friends, but never like played on a team in high school. It was just more being there, but I, I was able to get rid of the basketball because that season is way longer and it's way more of a time commitment. So like mm -hmm. I said, the school has been, you know, really, supportive and helpful in allowing me to do this, you know, this other career. But, uh, yeah. Has there been yeah. any, uh, creative ideas that came from, you know, you being at this small school? Um, oh, for sure. Like, I you know I never really, yeah, it's not true. I guess I wrote a short story called the teacher once it's pretty harrowing, <laughs> but no, just being around like teenagers is, you know, not, not that I'm an energy vampire, but just to take their energy. Uh, and honestly, like listening to them talk is like a great lesson in voice. Mm. dialogue especially as like the slang changes every like three to four years it's oh. really kind of fun to see uh you know and sometimes like you know there's been a few books where i've put i've directly taken some slang like my book disappearance of devil's rock mm. i was definitely using my very, very school specific slang i remember seeing a few reviews like wow those you know you know eighth grade boys are really annoying i'm like yes <laughs> eighth grade boys are really <laughs> annoying that's what i was kind of <laughs> you know going for but uh yeah. yeah well my students i teach um english and writing at three colleges and i'm kind of like a traveling three, college oh, instructor yeah but the gen z slang like sometimes i feel like i really know their dialect and then all of a sudden yeah. they'll drop a phrase and i'm thinking to myself i don't know what this even means like you need to yeah. they need to instruct me because oh for sure <laughs> The language is always, you know, we're always creating new phrases every yeah, generation. Absolutely. Um, now, but, my daughter was yeah. horrif my daughter was horrified recently when I used Riz correctly. Riz. I'd asked her, that, yeah, did I use it correctly? She's like, yes, and don't do it again. I'm like, okay. So if we see an <laughs> upcoming novel and Riz is like the supernatural yeah, demon. <laughs> that's a good idea. Like, oh, that's where uh, it came from. No, but yeah. And I just watched a knock at the cabin. I like was waiting to watch it until I interviewed you. And uh -huh. um, like, I know the differences. So I'm going to say right now, spoiler alert, because this is a big spoiler yeah. alert. But M. Night Shyamalan, I've always just been a huge fan. The Sixth Sense is like my uh, bread and butter um, when sure. it comes to like how psychological horror is told. Um, mm -hmm. So what was that process of just um, being consulted or like, because I know sometimes I've had Gregory Maguire on and he said like when he sold the rights to Wicked, it was just out of his hands. Like yeah. he gets invited back, you know, he got to go to the <laughs> film set. But right. did you have any um, play with A Knock at the Cabin? Like were you involved with the screenplay? Yeah, uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I similarly had no contractual say in anything uh, oh. involving the movie. Uh, we first optioned it in early 2018, which is like six months before the book was published. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it was a very long process. It took a couple of years before there was a screenplay uh, that I read. Then, you know, they let me give comments on it. They didn't listen to any of my comments, but, <laughs> but even then it was like, a, so that was 2019. There was another probably full year before it was like, oh, M. Night's really interested. Hmm. Um, and he had a, a film deal in hand. He was like, oh, he, he probably wants to make this. He just has to finish making old first. 
Uh, but then like once old finished and then it was, I believe it was this, it was the summer of 21 things started really picking up speed where he was writing the screenplay. Then like in late fall, he started announcing like some of the casting and I did have a, my first phone call with him was in November of 21. You know, and that was a wild phone call. Like you mentioned, <laughs> you know, Sixth Sense. Like, you know, I, I watched Sixth Sense in the theater when I was like a a hobbyist writer, I would describe myself, you know. Uh, you know, so here I am talking to that guy. You know, and he was very, I appreciate that he was upfront with what he was going to change in terms of the story and things like that. And then in the spring, like he texted me some questions about, hey, where'd you get the inspiration for the design of the the design of the weapons and a few like side questions like that. But I didn't even get to see a screenplay until um, like May after I had visited the set and <laughs> they were pretty much done shooting. So yeah, I, I mean, that's a long rampant answer to say, yeah, I had no say in anything. But I saw that incredible photo of you and like specifically Jonathan Groff, which mm. I'm a huge Broadway fan. So, yeah. you know, merrily we roll along spring awakening. <laughs> um, seems like, such like a kind soul yeah um, absolutely but that whole cast like really worked well together in my opinion especially to have a child actress like that i'm just curious like did you know anything about what it was like for them to have a child actress witnessing such gruesome sequences <laughs> yeah so i did get to visit the set two days um and the, and the cast were amazing they were all super friendly that was actually one of my favorite parts you know, Jonathan was super nice. So was, but Ben Aldridge and Nikki Muka Bird. Um, I didn't see, I didn't get to talk to Dave Batista as much, but he, you know, he was very nice. I had the whole cast like sign a copy of my book, which was fun. Aww. And I did get to see them again after the, after their premiere. Um, so being there only two days, I didn't quite see like, you know, how are they going to hide like some of the stuff from the the actor who played when, but they, they did have two because of, you know, child labor laws, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, if a, uh, because you know, you know the the actor who played when could only be there a certain amount of hours, so they would try to if it was later they would try to work around and have like her stand in, be in shots where there wasn't you know necessarily you weren't going to get like the full shot of her face. But uh, yeah, I, I have to admit I was a little <laughs> nervous meeting her and her mom at certain points because you know, they were really excited and in my head I'm like, oh, did you read the book? <laughs> um, yeah, I remember at the at the after the premiere you know I, you know her mom wanted me to take some pictures with when i'm like okay oh. don't read the book <laughs> or maybe i don't know yeah yeah you're like read it when you're in high school um yeah when you're a little bit older yeah yeah well are you currently looking for your next great read and you just don't know where to search well i have a publisher for you they are called Broadview Press. They're celebrating their 40-year anniversary. Happy anniversary, Broadview. And they are an independent publisher of humanities books. So next month for Native American Heritage Month, I have on Dr. Andrea Sullivan-Clark, and she is going to educate us on indigenous philosophies of Turtle Island. You might wonder what Turtle Island is. And if you're listening and you are in North America, I'm just going to give you a hint. You probably are in Turtle Island territory. So I can't wait for you all to hear more about Native American history and culture, just subjects that we need to learn about and we just don't in our primary school education. So Ways of Being in the World is Andrea's book. I can't wait for more of you to get your hands on it. Also, just in time for the Wicked film, Broadview Press has an edition of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz with the original illustrations. I was talking with Dylan from Broadview Press, and I always love talking with her because she informs me of what new books they are about to release. And guess what? Just in time for spooky season in the fall, they have a vampire literature anthology that collects so many different short stories that explored the vampire myth and just how this origin story of the vampire came to be in our culture. So I hope you get your hands on those books. And Dylan told me there is an exclusive code for all ITBR listeners. You get 20% off, 20% off all of your Broadview Press orders. Broadviewpress.com. Go choose your books 
type in ivory tower in the discount code section and you will get 20 percent off make sure you follow broadview press to see all the new books that they are about to publish on instagram at broadview press enjoy your reading everyone i mean the major difference right is the ending um mm -hmm that the husbands are actually the ones to survive spoiler um i said spoiler alert already but yeah, yeah, yeah. that when is actually accidentally killed and book, yeah. like i'm just wondering did m night Shyamalan make that change because he didn't want to have like the murder of a child or was there something else to his meaning well um yeah like i think especially with a big uh studio involved they felt like oh that would be too much you know, and they kept saying they also want to have like a quote unquote more helpful ending, ho uh, hopeful ending mm. uh, and things like that. And Knight was like, oh, you know, I'm making more of a thriller, not a horror novel. So like we can't have that happen. But the, he kept they kept talking about a more hopeful ending. Mm. Uh, and since we're talking spoilers, I think his ending is way more disturbing uh, mm. and not hopeful. I, I find the ending to my book hopeful. That's not to say terrible things don't happen in the book. But the idea that in the movie you know, that one of the dads and when have to not only live with the knowledge that they let, you know, one of their loved ones, like kill himself, sacrifice himself. Mm -hmm. They also have to live with the knowledge that there's just incredibly cool, capricious Supreme being that just, you know, killed thousands of people for what, for some sort of little weird yeah. mind game. <laughs> uh, I find that way more disturbing than okay. at least in my book, I, I viewed it as a hopeful thing. The two dads refused. They, th they thought, you know, they're essentially saying this is an immoral choice. Mm. You know, we refuse to we refuse to participate in this. Um, I don't know. So I yeah. know like uh, not everyone's going to feel that way, but that's how I feel. Well, I also just feel like the way that you center, like I know some have called it like such a wonderful depiction of queer trauma, like at the heart of your novel. But mm. like even to have just two men survive at the end of the world, like that there isn't this any like type of reproductive possibility if it's just mm. two men you know as a gay man i found it really like like your ending is very empowering but it's also like yeah. really going against that generational tradition like was that right. something you like have you wrestled with is like oh, okay this not saying like i've even said to my students when you talk to an author about their book and you ask them interpretive questions, you know, authors don't usually want to like have that interpretive <laughs> yeah. power over their books. But like, you know, what was that like to just have two men survive? That's a great question. I, you know, it's funny. I think, I, you know, because I started writing this book in 2015. And is that true? No, 2016. Sorry. I uh, started it like in earnest, like the summer of 2016 and finished it just about a year later. Uh, and in some ways... <laughs> I have to I have to admit I was not ignorant, but like I wasn't thinking about like some of the conversations that really came to fore, I would say in 2020. Like, I mean, these conversations were being happening, but like, you know, once the pandemic hit and George Floyd, there was a lot more conversations about um I don't know, uh, you know, civil rights, social rights, et cetera. Mm. You know, I started off the book from a place of, oh, I just written two books that that feature a couple of families in distress both by interior and exterior forces. And I didn't want to have the same family. And this was going to, and cabin was going to be my seventh book that I wrote. And that felt like a special number to me. So I was like, Oh, uh, when I first started writing besides my wife, my, my consistent first readers, and they were reading like the terrible early stuff, but always so supportive uh, was my cousin, Michael and his husband, Rob oh. and my aunt Mary and her wife, Debbie. And I was like, okay, you know, with this book, I kind of want to honor Try mm. to honor them, you know, for all the, you know, things that they've done to me and like, you know, their dear friends and loved ones. So that was really sort of the place from where I started. Uh, so I, I don't know if I necessarily was thinking of like the high minded ending beyond like, no, these two are going to choose. They're going to choose hope over fear. They're, you know, they're going to choose love over fear, which my, my main worry is like, I didn't want it to be like too saccharine. I didn't want it to be too sappy or, or uh, you know, sentimental. Yeah. Um you know, because obviously they'd been through hell and back, and who mm -hmm. you know, and who knows what laid ahead of them. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and, and for that book, I brought back like <laughs> Michael as my first like first reader. It's the first time I'd done that in like a long time. Mm. Um, and it's funny, like his his response to the book immediately was like, "Yeah, I don't think there's a uh, 
an apocalypse happening. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. Like, I, I not good that he's right. It was like, good. I just assumed everybody would assume. It's like, okay, because I kind of wanted people to to be able to think, you know, both ways. And I way underestimated how many readers were going to be bothered by me not telling them if the apocalypse was happening or not. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, like <laughs> that psychological manipulative game that like these four who represent or symbolize possibly the four horsemen right. of the apocalypse. Um, but that was actually something I was going to ask you before we turn to horror movie, Paul, is like yeah. your book to me, and I think it's even shown through the film, which is wonderful. Like, I do think that even though like the plot doesn't necessarily follow the order of your plot yeah. or there's significant changes, I think that that like it has such an ancient, in my opinion, very like mythical um, Greek feel to it. Like mm. in my reading your work like has such a feel to Stephen King's Carrie or um the shining oh, like you. it really has that like tapping into the underbelly of the beast like polytheism or like what's mm -hmm. the unexplainable like to um the ancient Greeks say <laughs> I just taught Antigone like why does she keep trying to want to bury her brother and go against Creon and then like the gods they see the omens of the birds and right. like the interpretation that they put into nature. Like, I really felt that in your work specifically, I mean, you know, in a cabin at the end of the world, like that yeah. really comes through. Is that something, well, thank you. are you usually wrestling with those like ancient questions or like turning back to history? Yeah. That's a, oh, it's, <laughs> I have to, well, one, like I studied math in college. So, you know, I, I have like a very cursory knowledge of, you know, Greek tragedy, et cetera. Like I took Western Civ for, you know, a couple of years when I was in college. So, you know, I can't say I was expressly thinking about those sort of uh, myths. Um, but I, but I, what I will say is that I, I'm fascinated by characters caught in the maelstrom of like this wider world. And like, I'm just interested in like, what are they going to do? Like, what are they going to do now? Like, how, you know, how do we live through this? How does anybody live through this? When, when you really have no chance to like fix it, this isn't a, you know, a big blockbuster or like, oh no, we're going to stop the earthquake from happening by doing this or like some weird pseudoscience thing. Uh, and th I mean, the things I was wrestling with when I started the book, I feel like for the first time, or I should say one of the few times I started a book with like a political sort of context in mind. Usually that just sort of happens. Mm -hmm. But like I mentioned, I started it in the summer of 2016. So the, the book to me was like, oh, I want this book to feel like the anxieties that so many of us are feeling during the, the reveal of Trumplandia, mm. um, which we're sort of going through again, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So there was that, but also, I mean, I, you know, sort of the, maybe, you know, is there a supernatural being that's doing this? I mean, that's like a fundamental fear of mine that not only that there is a Supreme being, he's, you know, they're incredibly cruel. So I don't know, like those are sort of the two bigger things I was wrestling with. But it's still, you know, I hope the the characters, you know, hopefully personal story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like those anxieties, I mean, that's something with the genre of horror, like those anxieties, whether it be like current horror, I feel like there's so much with environmental crises and humanitarian mm -hmm issues and war and global conflict and you know political strife and yeah. like families attacking one another because of beliefs like do you think that that's why horror is just such a long like is so ancient as a tradition is because it always taps into the fears and anxieties of our everyday life uh yeah i definitely think that's a part of it i mean fear is a universal thing that you know, all conscious beings, you know, we can talk about animals too. Anything with a consciousness, you know, knows what fear is, experiences fear. Um, you know, and as a writer, I don't know, I'm just, I'm fascinated by it. Like what it does to people, how, how fear, you know, warps your decision making process uh, and things like that. You know, as well as like the weird, I would say the weird thing of it being, it can be entertaining. I know for some people, if it's, it's a cathartic thing. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's a catharsis for me. Um, you know, everyone's going to go to it for different reasons, which is another fun part about horror. You know, for me, it's like even like the mo if I think it works as a story, if I think it works as art, because not every horror story does. I mean, there's a lot I don't like. Um, 
I find it weirdly hopeful. Like just the, the idea that, oh, this filmmaker, writer, they see that something is terribly wrong. You know, and, and I, I like that. Oh, you feel that way too. Uh, I think Kazuro Ishiguro, a uh, Japanese writer, talks about that frequently, that sort of magic connection between writer, writer and reader. And for me, that just makes me feel less overwhelmed and less alone. Like, okay, someone else out there sees, you know, this madness, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that, that's a hopeful thing, I think, just that communication. Yeah. You know, at the same time, Evil Dead 2 is one of my favorite movies. I don't know how much, <laughs> I don't know how much of that's going on there, but I mean, there, there's something just to the energy of that movie. But anyway. Yeah, well, and something that Greek tragedies, because I have brought in some horror clips, like I actually just showed the Carrie, my favorite, one of my favorite horror film scenes is like yeah. the prom scene where she like yeah. just gets one over on all the bullies and like is in her glory, like the flames are blazing um, yeah. and she just opens the doors and she's just walking like a queen. But like... There is still some hope in Stephen King of like, she is able to, like Carrie's able to rise above after all of that horror bullying done to her yeah. and her mother's bullying. But Greek tragedies, it follows like that line where there is a little hope that even after all the deaths, um, a character comes to a realization that they were in the wrong. Like that catharsis can actually happen with the audience because they can sympathize with even the person who is seen as a villain. Where like, you know, in your novels, what I love so much is you leave us in, I know NPR, New York Times, like they've talked <laughs> a lot about the ambiguity that you leave in your mm -hmm. novels. Like, and is that unsettling nature, it seems like it's something that you just, you love to psychologically delve into is not leaving the odd, like not leaving your reader with all the answers. You yeah. like to have the gray exist at the end of this story. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. But uh, I mean, in that scene from Carrie, I mean, even starting from when they first show up, like the scene where she's dancing with, mm. with the guy that, she, you know, just spinning and it's, you know, wonderful filmmaking. Uh, yeah. But anyway, like, so, you know, not everything I do has ambiguity in it. I mean, but a lot does clearly, <laughs> Uh, and I take that seriously. Like, I know it's an ask for the reader. So I, I hope it never feels like a cheap sort of like twist ending. Like for me, if I'm going to use ambiguity, it has to be part and parcel of the theme. It has to be, in my mind, the only way that story can be told. Um, and now it's clearly something I'm obsessed with. Like, you know, I think, you know, you as a writing teacher, like write what you know, mm -hmm. I, I think is terrible advice. But, you know, write your obsessions is great advice because they're going to be there anyway. Um, I don't know. Like, I... I Usually I default, if there is a default, into trying to make my stories, I want them to feel like this could be happening. Mm -hmm. You know, with a head full of ghosts, I'm like, oh, maybe possession. I think a reality TV crew would show up. I wanted to try to make it feel as real as possible. You know, and the same thing with Cabin. Um, and so, I don't know. I just think, like, <laughs> whether or not something supernatural is happening, when I try to make that feel realistic, mm -hmm. I think... You know, so I've never seen a ghost, not that I believe in them, but I don't want to be proven wrong either. <laughs> I feel like if I experience something, quote unquote, supernatural, I think it would be really subtle. It would be hard to identify. And I would probably within the hour of the day be able to somewhat explain it away. But then that lingering mm. doubt w w would hang over. Um, I don't know. And to me, that's just I feel like that's a wonderful effect of a horror story that I try to go after a lot. Yeah. Well, even when Knock at the Cabin like the film begins and you see when talking um, to the mysterious man. Yeah. Um, I was like, it could, it could turn into the strangers. Like there is a right. time <laughs> where like being in the cabin, being in an isolated place, like you psychologically set us up as a reader thinking, Oh, they're going to murder them right away. Like right. to me, those films, like the strangers, I just get so uncomfortable as an audience member watching yeah. a film like that. Cause I know what's going to happen. I'm like, they're not right. going to survive. Like this is not, <laughs> nothing good is coming from this. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean with horror movie, like my first question is like that meta nature, like you really tap into what I love so much is this is the time for your book, Paul. Like, and I mean that in all <laughs> seriousness, because yeah. I feel like horror as a genre in literature has had a lot of like contested identity issues, like thinking about 
Well, what does that mean when it comes to like us versus the outside world or us and our internal struggles? Right. Um, and maybe that's because of like global politics. I don't know. But um, I think yeah. that there's so many, there's so much fear right now out there that like, to want to like delve deeper into fear in your own personal, like viewing or reading life uh, is more just triggering to some people. Yeah. But like what you do is so, I mean, innovative is like actually writing a book that also becomes a screenplay, like where they're actually trying to put together a horror movie and then it gets lost. And then Hollywood decides, yeah. okay, I guess we'll reboot whatever, this lost footage is, which wasn't even a movie, but I guess we'll call it a reboot of a cult, <laughs> like put, putting together a cult, um, the cult following exists. So like there is an appetite for it. Yeah. You know, where did that idea come from of, okay, I want this like film within a film type narrative. Um. So some of it came from just like a little bit of a logic experiment, like, Early on, uh, I fell into like a Texas Chainsaw rabbit hole, which I briefly mentioned earlier that I mm -hmm. avoided watching because of its more because of its reputation. I mean, the title of the movie alone, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, and I, I just remember back like when I was growing up, like, oh, that must be like one of the goriest movies. And like, there's these weird cultural memories that are false. Uh, what's that called? I forget what's that called. The Mandelbrot effect or something like that. No, oh, like Mandela where the effect, Berenstein. Right? Like people thought yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. the Berenstein Bears. Right. Or the, yeah. I forgot the actual, um, yeah, yeah, the example they use, but it's like the Berenstein Bears. Yeah, yeah. Right. But with, so with that movie, I mean, there are people like who had these memories of seeing Leatherface like disembowel a character actually cutting with the chainsaw. Oh. And that doesn't happen in the movie. Like you, it's not quite bloodless, but it's almost bloodless. Like you, you certainly don't see any penetration of a chainsaw into somebody or are hacking off a limb. And if it came out today, you know, it would probably be like a low R, maybe borderline PG 13. If the original came out. Um, so I, I was fascinated sort of by the effect that the movie had, because to me that seemed like the movie replicated a little bit, some of the affect of, a, of, of reading, like, you know, reading is much more active generally than watching a movie. Like, you know, the images sort of wash over you, um, but Chainsaw does something where <laughs> it sort of activates, activates your brain almost like a reader. Like it makes you see things that, or imagine things that aren't actually on the screen. Mm. Um, so I was fascinated by that part of it. And like, I was like, I wanted to compare like in this book, like what are the differences, the pluses, minuses, well, maybe not pluses and minuses, but the different effects of and affects of, of, of reading versus watching a horror movie. Have you ever asked yourself, how does Andrew know about all of these LGBTQ plus books, films, TV shows, even theater happening in New York City? Well, I'll give you all a look into my interview process. The Gay and Lesbian Review is my definitive magazine that I turn to. I have a digital subscription and I learn so much about the current LGBTQ literature and TV and films that exist in the universe of all things queer art and culture. So Stephen Hemrick, the publisher, has promised me, and I know he keeps his promise, that the November-December holiday issue is going to be just such an incredible array of diverse voices in the LGBTQ community. So right now, though, you can read the September and October issue. It's called The Scientist, and it's all about investigating, interrogating queer science. Vernon Rosario, who's been on the podcast, has an article called The Origins of Transgender Science. Andrew Holleran, who wrote the definitive gay, iconic book, Dancer from the Dance, has an article about Lord Byron and sexual mutations. William Benjamin has an article about pervert patient zero. I need to read that right away. That's an incredible, enticing title. And soon I will have an episode coming out on election day. Yes, I'm releasing an episode on election day, all about LGBTQ politics and just what does my co-host think about the current state of gay politics? So thank you to Steven. The GNLR has an exclusive ITBR code. It is 
ITBR50. You receive 50% off, 50% off your print or digital subscription. So head to glreview.org, click subscribe, enter promo code ITBR50, and you will get 50% off. Also, make sure you follow the Gay and Lesbian Review on Instagram. It's at the GL Review, and you will see updates and teasers to upcoming articles, essays, and conversations that will be on their website and in the magazine. I hope you all enjoy your reading. Um, and I was just interested in the, the idea of art in general, sort of the price of art, especially from the collaborative side of things, which I have very little experience with. Um, you know, that movie is famous, was a famously rough, dangerous set. Um, and everyone involved, like we're taking huge risks, both financially, because it was a zero budget, I'm sure mental health wise, which they weren't thinking about in the seventies, probably as much, uh, you know, shooting for, you know, for like 20 hours, you know, other, you know, and actually, <laughs> and physically dangerous because they were using real chainsaws and, you know, some of the shots that they set up, you know, so, so lucky that they didn't end up actually cutting somebody. But, you know, this, this movie is a piece of art. So to me is like, is, I think it's worth it. You know, I probably, I hope I wouldn't say that if someone died on set. But I, I think that's a really interesting, I thought it was a very interesting question mm. about art and horror art in particular. Like, where's the line? You know, what what's worth it? I mean, especially for something that depends on transgression, right? Horror has to have it, some sort of transgression in it. It has to make you uncomfortable in some way. Mm. Um, I don't know. So I was thinking about a lot of that, you know, bigger picture wise. But and, sorry, this is a rambly answer. But the, <laughs> the thing with the screenplay, for me, it was a little bit of logic. It was like, okay, I knew it. I had this older film in 93, got made pretty much, but never made it to screen. And then we're going to follow this character as he bounces back and forth between the past and present as being rebooted. And I knew I needed the reader to know the story of the movie mm -hmm. or what the movie was. I just thought it would be really boring to have characters sitting around talking about what happened in the movie. I was like, oh, no, I'll, I'll include the screenplay. That way they get to see the whole what was supposed to be the whole original movie. Um, and that was really sort of the starting point for the inclusion of the screenplay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that, I mean, so many are using the term cursed film genre, like to talk about this lost <laughs> screenplay or like the yeah. mysterious deaths, right? Like at the beginning, it's not a spoiler. Like we know that there's been, you know, something happened. Yeah. Unknowable. Yeah. Um, just horror, like deaths, accidents, um, very like Phantom of the Opera, like something's been haunting this cast of the film. Um, and there's only one survivor left who actually can join the reboot cast um, 30 years later. I'm curious, was, was that something like you did not reveal all of your cards, like as the creator of right. this novel? Is that exciting for you, like for the reader to try to like just be in anticipation of that climax? Like, OK, well, what happened, you know, to those who are writing the screenplay like where are like how do they meet their end like how do you build that right. suspense throughout your novel uh yeah so part of it to me that was like the big question that i know i wanted hang over the reader i mean you were talking about the strangers before and you know the fact that you know <laughs> something terrible is going to happen um that's a great source of suspense for for the reader you know and the same thing in horror movie i, I was kind of hoping that it would continue to pull the reader forward because they want to find out what happens to, you know, character X, you know, who I reveal pretty early isn't, isn't alive anymore. Um, but what they don't know is how it happened. And at the same time, there were other, I was hopeful that it was other threads from like 15 years after the movie and, and from right now that hopefully all sort of build towards, you know, uh, build toward a climax by the end. You know, and hopefully I think that worked for some people. Uh, it worked for me. <laughs> no, it definitely works. No, no, it works. <laughs> yeah. In my opinion. Um, but like also the whole like premise of the thin man. I mean, I first learned about your book from, um, I mean, I had been like always on the lookout to see like what new horror novels are being published. So like it like came up right away that it was coming out, um, you know, in the summer. Oh, that's another question I had for you, Paul. Like the release of your book, um, like I was thinking, oh, it'll come out during the Halloween season. But like, was <laughs> there a reason why it came out 
like in the summer season? Yeah. Well, uh, for one, because I still teach, like if it mm. came out in October, I wouldn't be able to do like promotional stuff. So I've been fortunate that my publisher has worked with me to, to have all my books come out in the summer. And also I wouldn't want a horror book coming out in October. It's like, I'm giving up like a free, <laughs> a free rediscovery of your book. Like the movie, you know, the book comes out earlier in the year and then mm -hmm. people start talking about it again in like September, October. So that's true. Um, but it's, it's mostly the, <laughs> you know having a book come out when i'm off for the summer is, is just better for me no okay yeah so logistical reasons that makes sense yeah um <laughs> i mean i also just think it's amazing that you're balancing um like you and so many other writers like i had mary mcmin on who is a creative writing professor and um just wrote the book a rose by any other name which is like a retelling of who the dark lady is in shakespeare sonnets um so like, I just, to see the reality of, okay, our favorite writers, they're also teachers or they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're working it everywhere they can, you know, because yeah, the writing industry, it's, um, money can be difficult. I know yeah. uh, the reality, but like something that I'm just curious with, with the thin man is like creating this device or characterization like the horror that the actor even faces that we learn and i'm not going to reveal too much sure but the horror that he faces from the cast and it's not even like fictional physical acts that's done to him it's like almost method method acting gone wrong right like method acting that's full of almost torture porn like what was um, where did that come from of you knowing that like that device you were going to use, like him being cast in this role and then us as readers not knowing the actual horror done to his body? Yeah. Um, hmm. So, I mean, some of it came from, you know, so early on, I, I kind of had to figure out what was the movie inside the book. <laughs> yeah. um, and I came up with just like a general concept that I, I don't, quite want to say because it's a little bit of a spoiler and so i just kind of followed that like what that necess that necessitated the fictional characters in the screenplay doing awful things to this kid um you know to this character um and you know i knew it was going to be from his point of view mainly although the screenplay is from chloe's point of view chloe cleo sorry <laughs> um from cleo's point of view so there is another uh you know there is another point of view but anyway so i I also just thought it'd be fascinating to have like, you know, the thin kid when he's actually acting in this movie in 1993, you know, he's barely out of college. He's a very sort of like vulnerable, not confident kid, but you know, 30 years later, you know, his 50 year old self is much more confident, almost to the point of being smug and cynical, mm. you know? And so what happened, <laughs> what happened to sort of do that to him uh, or, you know, what sort of changes did he, you know, go through, you know, which I, I kind of hope would mirror sort of like the story itself. Whereas, you know, the thin kid, the thin kid character goes through a type of transformation as well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It was, it was a lot of it is, because I didn't actually, this is one of the books that I didn't write. I didn't sit down and write a plot summary for first, which I've done for a lot of my books. Um, I kind of, I don't want to say I winged it the whole time because I definitely kept notes and would peek ahead. But uh, no, I mean, as I'm sure you talk about as a writing teacher, there's a lot of it was just learning to trust your subconscious and then figuring out what that means or if it has to stay after the fact. Yeah. And ultimately, I wanted I wanted the movie and the, the book to be like my fi my favorite kind of horror movie, just sort of like inexplicable, maybe even pretentious, indie, uh, disturbing horror movie. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that. Um, so I'm close to... Eric Gary Anderson and Jeffrey Weinstock, the like gothic professors. So like, oh, you nice. know, I was yeah. part of their book club in the summer when we read um, for the Society for the Study of the American Gothic, your novel. And it was interesting to hear from like the academic community. They were like <laughs> just very invested in like the whole um, just providing like a theoretical language for, mm. okay, like what's like, what's up with the thin man? Like who, um, you know, what's so horrifying about this character? Like, 
how did you create a horror villain? So it was like interesting <laughs> to see how they were like trying to concoct like what was really um, evil about mm. like the fictive element of the horror movie itself that you create. Um, so like, I mean, something that I was just invested in is I'm a huge like just meta. Like I love Scream. I love that yeah. it, like Wes um, Craven is was always so into um his characters being in the know and scream about other horror right. films and like i was curious scream 3 is that like meta scream film where it's like the hollywood industry is like you know doing all the stab films and right. like you as an audience member are not only watching nev campbell like face out the horror of ghostface following her it's like you also are following those who are pretending to reenact the original scream. Right. Um, so like, what was that Hollywood element for you? Like, did you find it was interesting to kind of see what Hollywood does with horror stories and sometimes yeah. like how they sensationalize certain aspects, like whether it be the like sexual elements or whether it be like um, the stereotypical, um, you know, phone call that happens like all of those tropes that Hollywood just right. loves to do with horror novels <laughs> or turning horror yeah. novels into films. Right. Yeah. I mean, so as you pointed out, I mean, there's a long tradition of, of meta horror films and meta novels. And even like within the past like three years, there's been a whole bunch of, of like quote unquote curse film horror novels, which is kind of fun. Just that, that zeitgeist -y thing is happening. Um, and, you know, for me, I think part of my interest in it was just I've been in a position where I, I have had some Hollywood experience, um, you know, besides knock at the cabin, I've had many things optioned and not, not come through. And I've had all sorts of conversations, you know, with producers. So a lot of that stuff that happens in the book, you know, the book opens with the thin kid talking to a, to a pretty, you know, schmarmy <laughs> producer. Uh, yeah. And that was sort of right out of my life. <laughs> so, I mean, some of that was like, I did want to like, hopefully have a little bit of fun and satirize sort of the Hollywood thing uh, and represent some of my frustrations as someone who loves, you know, who loves a good horror story, who loves it when it achieves art. Uh, mm. For me, more times than not, especially in this century, it's not being produced like by large studios, unless you're Jordan Peele or or something like that. It's being produced by, you know, independent places and sort of newer th filmmakers that really have to sort of like fight and scrap for their vision to to make it through without having like the rough edges sanded off or cut off. Um, you know, so that was definitely like sort of a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and also to, to people listening out there, you know, to be a little bit fair, there's a character who's a horror writer that I definitely uh, <laughs> uh, sort of satirized to. You know, I figured it would be only fair if I'm making fun of like Hollywood producers type, you know, I make fun of this horror writer at a, at a horror convention mm -hmm. to a little bit. So I don't know, like it's, it's weird. Like in some cases, like, yeah, like ghosts and monsters are, are somewhat absurd, but if you're willing to engage with it, they're not absurd. It's, you can do so much with, with them uh, in terms of story. Yeah. Well, and not that you have to like, you know, make some uh, scandalous, like reveal about <laughs> your feelings on the Hollywood industry. right yeah, now. Yeah. But like, I am just curious like you hear all the time, there's just incredible novels. It just, it's not just horror novels, but like yeah. incredible novels that are going to be adapted into a film. And, you know, people will say a lot about Stephen King's newer adaptations. Like a lot of, I think um, there was like a new fire starter or yeah. like a lot of like the newer ones they try to adapt. Um, I mean, I think it was pretty successful, but that's yeah. my own feeling. Like, do you think it's like conversations you've had with producers? Is it just that like what you see as like a nuanced narrative isn't seen as marketable? Like a lot of it comes down right. to, oh, okay, well, we have to package it in this way. And if we don't like, you know, have characters that speak to the audience that they see as um, likable or believable, then like it's just not going to work for a mainstream audience. Like is that right. where sometimes a narrative just gets so diluted? Absolutely. I mean, because it is ultimately all about money. You know, and frankly, in some ways, I get it. Like even, you know, with Knock at the Cabin, their budget was $25 million. Yeah. <laughs> And when I visited the set, I was like, holy shit. 
this is 25 million, just like this army of people working and like, you know, they built a cabin inside of a warehouse and all this stuff. Um, you know, so I get that that's like a huge investment, but um, in terms of the story, it, it's frankly kind of maddening. Now, listen, I've talked to and worked with many producers who are awesome, awesome people. Yeah. Uh, but like, <laughs> you know, seven out of every eight are like humans that you can talk to, but like one out of eight, maybe one out of seven are like the producer I described in the opening page of the book or, or like, you know, they're, you're having a, a zoom meeting with them and you can see that they're answering email as they're supposedly listening to you and talking to you. It's just, oh, no. it's just bizarre. And like, just the idea of like the ghosting is like part of the thing. Like you'll talk to a producer and they'll sound like your best friend and you'll never hear them again. It's just, it's just so strange. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't understand. Uh, you know, what I also don't understand frankly is, you know, and this is a little bit self-serving, but like, hey, how about leave, <laughs> how about leave the story elements to the people who know story, like the writers and the film director? I mean, it, it just seems absolutely nuts to me that all these producers, you know, come in with notes or have a say and like, what, what do you know about story? Like, and so often I've heard like just terrible suggestions and terrible ideas, mm. you know, come from producers. So I don't know. Uh, mm. Again, this is coming from novel land you know where i have one editor that i have to <laughs> satisfy i'm not i don't have to listen to a room of 20 other people coming in with like their two-bit sort of suggestions i don't know yeah well yeah. and someone who actually grew up in salem is mike flanagan um and massachusetts has produced a lot of <laughs> new england has produced a yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. horror for sure. yeah. uh, writers and film directors um but like i'm curious like say Mike Flanagan, the way his like universe has now just like evolved. Like there's always, you know, whether it be Fall of the House of Usher or like mm -hmm. he's always just coming out, adapting gothic literature and horror literature. Um, like how do you think that that, like the engine that he's built, like how does that, you know, even, you know, for those listening who are aspiring horror writers, like, you know, Paul, how did it happen just even for you for it to start to domino where, you know, now you have an editor who is yeah. like asking, okay, well, what's your next subject? <laughs> like, what yeah. are you now interested in? Well, yeah, for, I mean, for me, it was definitely like a long winding road. Um, you know, I started messing around with writing in the late nineties, almost inexplicably because, you know, I just gotten my master's degree in math, never studied writing. But for me, what, what started it was, sort of a later in life than maybe most discoveries. It's like, oh, it's it's okay to actually like things. Hmm. You know, which, uh, <laughs> you know, for younger people, you know, there's so much of like, you know, the pose of, you know, you don't want to be, it's usually not cool to be like, oh, I like this, et cetera, which is still sort of like the life of the internet as well. Everybody hates everything. But no, for me, that was like a big deal, discovering that, oh, like it's okay to be passionate about the things I like. And that included like punk music and, and these stories I just started falling in love with. You know, and I tried to I tried to become a punk musician and I was messing around with writing and I figured I was a better writer than musician, unfortunately. Um, but once I started taking writing more seriously, it was, you know, short stories that I was submitting to markets um, if from 2004 to 2006. I, I wrote this novel that wasn't horror, but and I was trying to find an agent with it. And it took me two years to find an agent, hundreds of rejects. Mm. But I just stayed patient. Um you know, it's a different publishing landscape now. And I'm glad I came up when I did, because I think the urge would have been to self-publish and not that uh, self-publishing is the worst thing in the world. I just think that's a hard, almost impossible road to hoe. Um, but for me, it's like whenever I wrote something, it's like, no, someone's got to pay me for this. I'm not giving this away, you know, for free. It was just too hard. Like, uh, so I just gave myself permission to be patient, you know, and I had a, a day job that gave me shitty health insurance. So it was a little bit easier you know, hey, if the story doesn't work out, I'll just write the next one. Like, yeah. I'm not going to try to satisfy some imaginary, you know, thing that the mainstream is going to like. I'm going to write stories that I want to read and, you know, and just believe, hopefully, that there'll be enough weirdos out there like me that would want to read it some, at some point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that's the longest, short, long or short version of it. But so it was just dumb patience, just trying to give myself... Uh, yeah, in terms of math, I thought of it in terms of opportunities. The more opportunities, the more tries I gave myself, the greater chance I had of having a little bit of luck and something hitting. Yeah, and you were always being authentically 
passionate, right? Like it seems like even Mike Flanagan, he believes in um, the work he does. But again, we see people at their success peak. Like we see yeah. Paul Tremblay in bookstores, right? Like we see the collection <laughs> of your books, but we yeah. don't see the journey. Like it's not an overnight, like it didn't just happen. It's oh, definitely not. Yeah. It's a pathway that people create. And it does seem like what connects those who are able to break through is you have put in the work to be passionate and, you know, make those, um, like make things, make art that doesn't reach the masses. Like yeah. you make art that sometimes just exists for your own and like your own creative interests. And then it sure. leads you to that project that speaks to the mainstream. Yeah. And I think, you know, the nice thing, one of the nice things about sort of horror fans and horror writers and readers is for the most part, you know, every community is going to have like their bad actors. Um, but, you know, I found the horror community to be really supportive yeah. and welcoming to new voices, you know, wanting to see people do well because we like horror. Like yeah. in some ways it's like we, when we greet each other, we get so excited because in our day to day life, there just aren't, we're not running into many horror fans. So when we do meet someone who like has that, same interest we like we clutch to them <laughs> so you all have heard me talk about my friend christian garcia's excellent podcast called that old gay classic cinema well just in time for spooky season everything fall and gothic he just had on friend of the show joseph federico to talk about dracula Yes, Dracula starring Bella Lugosi. So you can now listen to that episode wherever you get your podcast, like Spotify or Apple. And you might have seen I've been releasing some That Old Gay Classic Cinema episodes on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. You can now listen to his premiere episode that I got to talk about The Sound of Music with him, which I really loved that I was on the inaugural episode. Thank you, Christian. Also, we released his Gone with the Wind episode, and we only released part one. So to listen to part two, you have to head over to his podcast. So if you love all things classic cinema and you've wondered, wait, what makes some classic cinema just really queer? <laughs> like, oh. it actually sometimes is more homoerotic than current contemporary films. You want to listen to Christian's podcast. And he also has a special Wizard of Oz episode that I absolutely fan over. So listen to that old gay classic cinema, Apple, Spotify, and he's on YouTube as well. I hope you all enjoy it. Yeah. And I do and feel like our like, enthusiasts, in my opinion, tend to be the most psychologically balanced people because they found ways to like let loose their anger and frustration and stress with outlets that are um, like, they can put their desires into healthy outlets where, <laughs> you know, fictive people are the ones who are, you know, doing all the illegal yeah. activities. Um, <laughs> you know, you should see the yeah. reality TV community, Paul there. Yeah. They got some interesting skeletons in their closet but um <laughs> so you know i do have to like as we're nearing the end i'm just so curious like to get a review i mean not to like say stephen king is you know the guru of all things horror literature but i do think he is um oh, yeah. you know just like joyce carol Oates, like mm -hmm. very prolific and um like for him to read your work and say about horror movie i think doesn't he what does he say again that it was like um like terrific but also extremely troubling or something <laughs> yeah in that regard no, like have yeah. you do you have many conversations with stephen king uh yeah so he first like tweeted about my book a head full of ghosts mm -hmm. uh which really frankly like gave that book just like a push that needed and, you know, and helped turn it into like this weird, like cult hit novel. Um, yeah. So immensely grateful to Steven for all the support. He's been, you know, super supportive of my work and yeah, he and I email, you know, fairly regularly, um, you know, super nice guy, very down to earth. Uh, you know, 
he, I'm sure he has an ego, but it, it comes off as egoless <laughs> as well. Um, so no, like I, I, beyond like, I fell in love with reading because of Stephen and actually and Joyce Carol Oates that you mentioned. I fell in love with reading, never mind writing because of those two. So no, uh, I can't put a measure or value on how much, you know, his work and his support has meant and, and continues to mean. Yeah, well, and something that I think why, like, I even fell in love with horror, it was through Stephen King and Carrie. That was my first horror novel in middle school. Yeah. Um, is like horror and fairy tales to me, like follow a close path. Like, right. I mean, a witch who's burning children alive and turning them into gingerbread cookies yeah. is incredibly evil. Um, yeah. But like fairy tales usually have the happy ending. It's like horror is just without a happy ending. And right. <laughs> like, I think Stephen King said Carrie was like an upside down Cinderella. Like if it oh, just went, yeah into the horror malevolent realm. But, right. um, you know, what for you just, you know, Paul keeps you going in terms of like finding ideas, like even right now, is there anything you're turning to for, okay, this is probably going to be my next creative idea. Mm. Um, I, I wish I was a writer that had like this <laughs> backlog of stories like, Oh, I know I'm going to write this. And I, and I usually, especially novels, I usually go from, novel to novel and I have to find it like and start all over again, you know, which in some ways is kind of fun because I feel like that keeps it fresh for me, but it's also terrifying. Cause like, Hey, what if, <laughs> what if I don't have an idea? Um, but I, but I also like, I know, I don't think I'll run out of, you know, who knows, maybe I would run out of ideas, but typically so many come from what we were talking about earlier. There's the spark and passion of listening to music that I love or watching movies or reading books. Mm -hmm. You know, read, you know, just even reading something like um, Mariana Enriquez's Our Share of Night. I could never in a million years write that novel. It's so damn perfect and genius. Mm. But it just excites me. It makes me want to try something. I mean, that that's that's the part like I I hope never leaves, you know, for as long as I you know keep writing is it comes from a, a place of, you know, it comes from a place of being a fan and admirer of other people's art. Um and that what helps that helps me fuel my own. It's like, oh, I want to try to do do something cool, you know, maybe not exactly like that, but something that makes someone else feel like this is making me feel. Um, so yeah, unabashed. Look, I look to other places for inspiration for sure. Yeah. Well, I have to even let you know, my parents have been consuming the audiobook, which I have to say, everyone out there, like if you yeah. <laughs> don't even know think you're an audiobook lover, like horror movies, an incredible audiobook with this, I think it's a nine cast. Yeah. Um, performing the book, but someone I've had on the podcast, Michael Crouch, is one of the actors. And uh, oh, nice. I always love Michael's yeah. interpretation uh, when he does like these psychological thriller type characters. Um, but yeah, you're just the audiobook is incredible. It's just you've really created. Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good cast. Um, but like you've created such a well done. Um, like not only novel, but something that has such an appeal to a performance. Uh, so I have to ask, of course, Paul, yeah. um, is there like a film in the works for a horror movie? So, I mean, so I can't say with who or, or mm -hmm. what, but uh, just geez, at the beginning of October agreed to, to an option. So again, an option is like, uh, they essentially rent like a year and a half to try to get it going. But uh, I couldn't be more excited about who's involved uh, and what production company is involved. It's, it's really exciting to the point where, like, it's really hard for me to keep this news to myself. Hopefully, they make some sort of an announcement at some point. In the, you know, it's still far away. Like, we don't have anything. Like, we just sort of agreed uh, to do it. So, yeah, fingers crossed. But, uh, but I think if if it ends up being made by who you know we've agreed with, I I don't think they would sand off like the rough edges and, and mm -hmm. keep it and keep it disturbing and, you know, hopefully, you know, keep to the heart of, of what the story is about. Oh, good, good. Well, I'm excited for that, Paul. And um, thanks. just my final thing is if you will entertain me, yeah. I just want to read iconic horror films from the seventies, eighties and nineties. And I'm just curious, what is your favorite horror film from each of these categories? 
Um, I feel like it'll give us a lot of insight into even more into your mind. Um, (laughs) So from the 1970s, out of Halloween, Carrie, The Exorcist or The Omen, what is your favorite horror film? I I did. It's funny. I forgot which films. I did sneak a peek at these lists and I thought the other two decades were easy for me. (laughs) Uh, Geez, it might have to be The Exorcist. Uh, Although Carrie is probably pretty close. I will say, though, like I rewatched Carrie recently. It's great. But it is hilarious how old the actors are. They're playing teenagers. Like you can see some of them with like crow's feet. Uh, (laughs) It cracks me up. But it's hard not to say The Exorcist, you know, especially since, you know, the novel that sort of made me a head full of ghosts is definitely sort of in conversation with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the 80s, A Nightmare on Elm Street, Podergeist, Friday the 13th, or The Thing? Oh, the, the, it's easy for me because the thing is either the top or, or second favorite movie of mine all time. So yeah, mm-hmm. the thing for sure. Okay. Um, and then the 90s, The Blair Witch Project, Scream, The Craft, or The Haunting? Uh, Blair Witch Project, hands down. You know, The Haunting is awful. <laughs> Sorry, Jan DeBonts, if you're listening. Uh, no, Blair Witch Project. I, I use that movie as like a litmus test if I'm talking to somebody. If they don't like that movie. I kind of just discount the rest of their artistic opinions. (laughs) That's so obnoxious, but I can't help it. No, I love that movie. Uh, It's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Well, how can everyone Paul out there? I mean, (laughs) you have so many fans, but I want to make sure you get even more horror fans or not even those who listen to the podcast who didn't think they were horror fans. And, you know, I do think, you know, your novel is extremely frightening like extremely suspenseful, psychologically suspenseful, but it isn't like where you can't sleep at night. Like I do think yeah. that it, it's nice because it accesses a community where if they don't think they're horror fans, you can like nicely manipulate them, <laughs> which is yeah, good. like unlike Terrifier, where right, yeah, yeah, I think no. if you just don't like gore, you're never even going to turn on that TV. No. Um, yeah. So how can everyone follow you, Paul, you know, um, and, where can they uh, just get their hands on all things Trembly sure. Universe? <laughs> uh, so I'm probably most active on Instagram these days. So it's at Paul G Tremblay. It's my handle. Still barely hanging on to X or Twitter, I guess, with the same handle. Uh, I'm on Blue Sky. I think it's just Paul Tremblay. Uh, but if you go to my website, which is paultremblay.net, I also have like a free sign up for a newsletter. Yeah, I usually only send that out like once a month. So I'm definitely not spamming your inbox, but yeah, you know, partially with updates. And I usually write some sort of little, like little essay about whatever happens to be going on. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, Paul. This has been wonderful. And thanks for, you know, being here in time for Halloween. And I can't wait to see what happens with horror movie. I'm, you know, going to. Yeah. Make sure I keep up to date <laughs> with all things going on in your universe. Yeah. And I can't well, wait you, for Andrew. your next novel, Paul. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, have a great day, Paul. And, you know, bye to everyone out there. <laughs> While I'm no longer a Long Island resident, yes, I have graduated to North Jersey. I've moved in with my boyfriend. And, you know, I'm just very grateful. So, When I like to reminisce and recall the beautiful fall nostalgic memories I have about Port Jefferson Village, located in the middle of Long Island, right on the Long Island Sound, you can see Connecticut on a clear day. I think about the Soapbox NY, a beautiful bath and body boutique. My friend Janine Cucci is a co-owner there. Her mother, Mariana, is at the helm of the ship. And I know that they have such wonderful fall products from apple cider shea butter soap to pumpkin spice sugar scrub, Orchard Breeze hand and body lotion, and yes, Farmhouse Fresh, a paraben-free and very, very environmentally friendly and animal-friendly company. They do not test any of their products on animals. Splendid Dirt is a wonderful pumpkin mud mask that I still use even when it's not the fall because who doesn't want to smell pumpkin in the summer? I do. So head on over to Instagram, TikTok, at the Soapbox NY. If you message Janine on Instagram, she will get back to you within the day. 
If you want just like an assortment of some of her favorite fall products, she'll put that together for you. And if you need a beautiful town to visit in the Northeast, head on over to Port Jefferson because it is such a beautiful town, especially in the fall and the winter season. Okay, I hope you all enjoy your Soapbox NY products as much as I do. 